everybody. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Francis, and uh, I started this church almost 18 years ago, and uh, it's my wife, Lisa, and about a year or so ago, uh, the Lord just, we both felt on our hearts very strongly, like the Lord was wanting to start a new chapter in our lives with something different, and so we went all around Asia just trying to think, okay, maybe this is it, maybe it's China, maybe it's India, maybe it's Thailand, and uh, eventually ended up in San Francisco, and so... That's where we have been since January, and I've been back a few times talking, but this is actually Lisa's first time back, because, uh, yeah. <laughs> so she's been crying all morning, seeing people, and, you know. So um, Todd asked us to talk about marriage, and uh, so I thought, wow, this is perfect. I'll bring Lisa with me and have her share some thoughts, but I thought since even because you haven't even heard from her in, in over a year or seen her, um, that maybe she could just share some of the highlights from her perspective of, of the last year of life, the kids, adventure. Right. Yeah, I told somebody if, if I had seen the wrong person at the wrong time, I might have just melted into a puddle of tears after we started singing the first song, first service, because I, I, don't, I don't think I realized how much I miss all of you and... Um, just what a beautiful place this has been in our life, um, all the relationships that we have, being able to call so many people by name <laughs> up there. I don't know hardly anybody, <clears throat> and um, it's just a sweet reunion and a sweet time to come back and see all of you and get to share with you. So um, probably the most exciting news was our little baby Claire Love was born in May. She's number five, and um, she's, yay. <laughs> so uh, she has captured everybody's hearts in the family. Everybody adores her, and, you know, sometimes they're fighting over her. The poor girl is like, you know, who gets to hold her? So it makes it kind of nice. But um, it has been such a great, as much as I miss this, and it is sweet to come back, and I have tears of, of joy and um, just, I don't know, the richness of it all. But I, I can tell you that it is, it is a great joy to have laid down what we, we've known and um, to move forward and just follow God and take steps of faith and be uncomfortable um, it is a very weird feeling to go from being so connected to moving into an entirely new city and place where you really don't know people. You walk into Target and you're not going to be like, oh, I don't know anybody. Nobody's going to say, Lisa! Or, um, you know, Target is, they still have Target there, which is fabulous. So, <laughs> such a comfort because it is a very um, Asian community. And... Uh, <laughs> Oh, Francis and the kids are so happy. Just tons of creepy Asian food places. And I'm like, where are the white people restaurants in this place? <laughs> but I'm learning to love it. And um, it's fun at the kids' schools. There's just, you look on the blacktop, it is a sea of little dark-haired, beautiful children. And um, I'm really praying for the Lord to help me be able to relate in this different kind of community. And... Um, the high, one of the highlights for me watching my children, um, I have seen Rachel and Mercy, the oldest two. They will be turning 16 and 12. But they have really um, pursued the Lord on their own. The Word of God means more to them. I see them needing that scripture, that truth, in a way that they didn't as much here. Um, it's kind of come alive for them, their need for God. You know, that it was really scary for them to start new schools and know absolutely no one. And um, I've seen how we've prayed through issues and tried to love on people and really help them feel like God has put them there. This wasn't just mom and dad's calling. You know, this was for them too. And God has works for them to do in their schools and with the people that he puts in their life. And so it has um, kind of bonded us together in a unique way as a family as we all just experience the unknown, and it's an adventure, and it's been so worth it, and, but it's nice to be back. 
<laughs> yeah, it's 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 been really. Um, it, when when we're, when I'm asked to speak about marriage and family, I, I almost feel there's part of me that almost feels guilty, or um, I, I don't even know what to say sometimes because things in our home are so good that I almost feel like I'm sounding fake, and that people are going, "No, it can't be that good." But it, it really is, and it, it's not. It's not because oh, I'm such a great husband and dad, or or, or whatever else. It's it's just the what God has done in our lives, and it, it's kind of like in First John one when you. It's almost like John's trying to come up with words where he goes, "Gosh, I I, I saw him, I, I I touched him, I I, I talked to God, and I'm just I, this would make my joy complete. Is if you guys could understand this relationship I have with God and get that same thing too." I guess that's what I feel about our family right now. It's like, gosh, are you kidding me? This is ridiculous. Like, no one loves each other like this. They're, they're, this doesn't just happen. And I want everyone to get it. And we get so sad when we hear people struggling. And we're going, gosh, that's not how God designed the family. Like, it can be so beautiful, so fun. And this time of being away uh, as a family and just going on this adventure um, is what really brought us to, together even more. Um, not that that was the plan, but that's just what happens. And it's interesting because when I was in, a, when we were in Hong Kong, I, we thought we were going to stay there. It's like, gosh, I think this is it. This is this this feels right. Um, but really, the Lord impressed two things on my mind, two reasons why He wanted me back in the United States. And those two things, number one was, the first thought was discipleship. That I believe the Lord wanted me to come back to the States to really push what he emphasized in Scripture, which was the American church at large. One of our problems is that people do not make disciples. We've come up with a system where people show up and and they're so dependent on someone else to feed them. Um, and, and they'll do that for years and years and years and say, okay, you feed me and then your staff disciple me and then your staff take my kids and you raise them for me, tell them about God, tell my teens about God, tell my college student about God, tell the women about God, then they have men's ministry, tell the men about God. And it's all about the staff trying to do everything for the church. And yet what I see in scripture is that that wasn't the design at all. The design was that you were supposed to be doing that, that you actually make your own disciples and that it was the leader's job to equip you so that you go out and disciple other people, disciple your own kids, you know, disciple your neighbors, teach them about God. I mean, that was the great commandment that Jesus rose from the grave and said, go make disciples now that we are supposed to prepare you so you could be on your own. It's like my oldest daughter, she's uh, 15, she's, uh, she's a junior. And, and, uh, and I think, wow, she's a junior in high school. I got like a year and a half left with her. In a year and a half, I, by that time, I want to make sure that, okay, that she can survive on her own that she can work her own job, that she can make a living for herself, that she can develop, you know, start her own family or what. I mean, you should wait on that, I hope. You know, but, but you know, just, but I, the whole idea of self-sufficiency, I don't want my daughter 15 years from now saying, Dad, can you raise my allowance? Right? You don't want it back on, you know, hey, can I live with you guys? Can you feed me? Can you give, because I, I can't work. I can't do this. I still need, 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 need. No, our job as parents is to raise them to be independent. And that's the same thing in the church. The job is not that you come back 30 years, in 30 years still going, will you disciple me? Will you feed me some more? That's why in Hebrews 5, Paul says, This is crazy. Many of you should be teachers by now, and I'm having to feed you the elementary truths again? And so it's to bring back this mindset that is in many other countries, when they view Christianity, that's the way it works. Here we've got this other system where people are still here after 30 years and still scared to be sent out, still can't name a single disciple, a single person they baptized, led to the Lord, or taught them the ways of God, and they don't even feel comfortable teaching their own children about God. And so it's like, okay, let me help formulate a system to help equip you. See, here's what I want. I want to know 
that if you were the only, okay, think about this, if you were the only Christian in Simi Valley, just you, would you be confident that you could grow in the Lord? And would you be confident that you could actually lead other people to Jesus and teach them how to grow in the Lord? See, some of you can do that. And others are going, there's no way. If, if this weren't here, I'd fall apart. It's like, okay, that's fine. But let's get you to that point. That's the job of the church. And as we all start doing this, because look, it, you know, even, even, even sometimes you'd go, oh, man, I wish I could bring Francis to work to share with my friend. It's like, no, you. <laughs> like, that's the whole point of the Holy Spirit coming into you so that you would go and make disciples. So I'm very excited about that. I was talking with the elders about it yesterday morning, and, and uh, I've been working with some of the pastors here, and we've created this uh, that this way to help equip people so that you would feel comfortable teaching others and the church can become what it's supposed to be. So I'm very excited about that. And then the other thing that I felt like the Lord wanted me to come back to the States to talk about and emphasize before I go anywhere else is this issue of marriage. And, uh, and so it was, it, was, it was really cool when uh, Todd told me, hey, I want you guys to talk about marriage. I go, man, that's exactly... One of the reasons why I feel like I'm back in the States for a while is to really emphasize this issue. And, um, and, and, and the main point I want to make is I think we've been looking at marriage in the wrong way in the church. There's probably some of you here who are thinking, man, I'd love to serve God, but first we got to get our marriage together. And so you focus on your family, you focus on your marriage, you focus on your kids because you're going, man, we're not the model family. I shouldn't be leading. I shouldn't be teaching. And I'm saying if you try to do that, it's never going to work. What I want to say to you is being focused on the mission is actually what brings your family together. Otherwise, it's like saying, oh, I really want to get in shape so I can go jogging. <laughs> Actually, if you just jog, you, you'll get in shape, okay? It's, 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 that's, that's the way it works here. And so this whole idea of, well, I don't want to serve yet. I mean, the thing in, in our marriage has been from day one, it, it's been about, gosh, we're supposed to make disciples. I mean, we were married a couple weeks when I said, I think... We're supposed to start a church. Okay, that's, that's what the world will tell you. Don't do that. That first year of marriage is supposed to be just for the two of you. Okay, don't, don't get into ministry. Focus on each other. You need to be about yourselves. You know, get that right. And then once you have a kid, it's like, well, you know, it's a new baby. So just, you got you to gotta really nurture those first couple of years. It's like, oh, now they're in school. Okay, well, well until they're 18, you really got to just focus on your family. And I'm saying that's going to destroy your family, and it creates a terrible model for your kids of, oh, okay, family comes first, serving God, we can put that aside until it's convenient, and that's going to destroy you. The very thing that, that bonds us together is, is the fact that we're on this mission together. It's like Jesus says, if you seek the kingdom first, if you seek first, number one, what is the most important thing? most important thing is the glory of God and his kingdom for the people on earth to understand there's a king up there. And, and, and it's all about him. And i got to get people to come under his leadership, under his lordship. I gotta, that's what it means to make disciples. That's what Jesus rose from the grave to tell me to do. And as I seek him first, the other stuff will happen. That's why in that passage in Matthew 6, he goes, don't be like everyone else in the world, the people who don't know God. He calls them the pagans. He goes, they, they think, oh, i got to get all this money so I can get food, and they're worried about clothing. They're worried about this and that. He goes, no, I don't want you to be that way. That's the way they do it. He goes, you seek first the kingdom, and all this other stuff will be given to you. You put me first. And that's what I'm saying. When we put the family first, and say, okay, man, we got to protect this, we got to guard it, we got to work on our marriage, and that's your emphasis, then you're just like everyone else out there that just wants a happy marriage. And what God says, you seek the kingdom first and watch what happens. Watch what happens in your family. Watch what happens in your marriage. Watch what happens with your kids. I mean, our, 
you know, we, 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 I was scared, you know, when I left here. There was a fear like, oh, this is what I knew, and this could screw up the family, and all of you are warning me going, oh, but your kids, you know, like you're tearing them away, or this or that, and they're going to hate you. And, and it's like, no, this was the very thing that made us so tight as a family. I, I didn't realize that, but do you know what it's like to be in India and hold hands as a family and say, God, is this where you want us to stay? You know, when you're the only, you're just going, man, God, is, is this it? And then to end up in a city where we don't know anyone, no friends, nothing like, okay, guys. Man, it, it just, just even um, a couple of weeks ago, we, we, my friend and I that I met up there, we, um, we did this conference in the inner city of San Francisco. We said, let's do a conference where it's not just singing and teaching all day long. Like, let's have them actually do stuff. And so they, they showed up, and, and hundreds of Christians showed up. In fact, we had to turn away a couple hundred because we didn't have room for them. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we do a teaching time in the morning, a little worship. And then for eight hours, they're walking the streets, sharing their faith with people, you know, getting the homeless people, feeding them, everything else, you know, washing their feet, cutting their hair. We got medical teams. We got all of this stuff. And while people are in line, everyone's just telling them about Jesus, listening to their stories. Tell me about your life. That, that these people, no one ever listens to them. So it's like, man, tell me about your life. How'd you end up here? And just treat them like normal people and then start to share with them the love of Jesus. And so for hours, we did that. And then at night, we worshiped again. And it was like, <laughs> Man, it was just powerful. You're just looking at each other like, oh, that was it. That's what church is supposed to be. This, is, this feels very New Testament. No one wanted to leave. Um, and, 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 and with all of that, you know, here's my family who's with me. I'm teaching. Lisa's leading worship. I see Rachel for like four hours just sitting on the stool as homeless men and women are, are staying there. And she's, she's washing their feet, scrubbing their feet for them and sharing Jesus with them and doing pedicures. And this, to see your little girl doing that. And then, and then to see little Mercy, little 11-year-old knocking on apartment doors. Do you guys need some groceries? You know, do you, you know how, how can I pray for you? You know, and then telling people about Jesus. And then, then as, as a family, just kind of getting back to together and and i i can't tell you the bond of that okay it's it's not yeah sure it's fun to go on vacation whatever but it's something about serving the god the, the god of the universe and the unity that takes place when you're on a mission together it just happens i, I mean how many of you how many of you ever gone on like a short-term mission trip like just a couple of weeks or whatever okay a lot of you a lot of you've been on a mission trip Okay, think about the people you went with on your last mission trip. You're thinking like a missions team. Now, were those people you would normally hang out with? A lot of times, no, right? You get there and you're like, oh, no. I'm, I'm going to be with you for two weeks, right? Like, it's just the most awkward. Like, you got all these different types of people. But what happens by the end of the trip? You go, wow, I actually missed that old lady, you know, or that little punk kid. Like, man, this weird, like you become this family. Why did you get together and say, you guys, let's try to be really tight? No, you got on a mission together. And by the end, you're like, no way. I love these guys. You know, I miss these guys. Why? Because when you seek the kingdom first, all the other things come together. And that's what I'm saying, man. I'm not some, you know, marriage guru to say, oh, here's how you do this, this, this. All I know is I've tried to serve God and try to lead my family wherever the Spirit's leading us to go. And as that happened, it's like, man, look at our family. This is ridiculous. You know, our kids are holding hands, hugging each other, loving each other, can't get enough of each other. It just crazy things start happening. You go, wow, we weren't even pursuing that. We were pursuing the kingdom and everything else fell into place, and we experienced God together. Um, i, I got to tell you one story, though, and then, then you can go. Um, <laughs> that conference, okay, I, shared at, I shared at that Forever Found thing that you guys did on Thursday night at Wood Ranch, which was beautiful for human trafficking, which even that, um, if we could learn to get, I mean, if you went there as a couple and you hear about kids, they're raped for 14 hours a day every day of their lives. And you go there as a couple or as a family, 
and suddenly get your mind off of yourself and your little problems of, oh, I got a B minus, you know, and you go, are you kidding me? People live like that? And suddenly your whole family goes, come on, you guys, we got to do something about this. We got to figure it out. That's the stuff that pulls your family together. That's the stuff when, you're, when, you, when you as a couple get, get off of yourselves and, and, oh, you're not pleasing me, you're not pleasing me, you know, and back and forth and go, oh, my gosh, 70 million people are starving in the Ethiopia region right now with, with, the, with the famine going on. Like they're just starving, like they're just dying. Boom, boom, boom. Another one just died right now. Like you start focusing on that and decide, we got to live for this. We got to do this. This is what God created us for. You talk about unity. Okay, that's how you bring yourselves together is not by focusing on each other more and more and more and more. It's about the two of you going, hey, let's, let's actually do something with our lives. Let's actually make disciples. Let's actually care for the poor. And God, God says in Isaiah 58, just, just you do that and I'll just go, man, here I am. What do you need from me? And that's why that, that, that conference... Okay, so we were doing it on Friday, like two weeks ago. On Wednesday, the Wednesday before the conference, we realized how many people were coming, and we said, we have to make 10,000 meals to pass out to all the people in the area, to the homeless, to the apartment. 10,000 meals. And, and the leader just gone, we have no meat. Like zero. This is a very boring meal. Hey, here's cheese. You know, I, I mean, it's just like... Wow, this is going to be awful. And so he asked, you know, can I borrow your credit card? It's like, oh, I don't know if it'll work. You know, try. Right after he announces it, an hour and a half later, about an hour and a half, hour to two hours later, Trader Joe's calls us out of the blue and says, our freezers all just broke down. <laughs> yeah. And... Do you guys have any use for all of our meat? And they bring a U-Haul truck filled, filled with like marinated, you know, pork chops and chicken and ribs and steak. I mean, Trader Joe's. I mean, not like John's Market or anything. It's like Trader Joe's. It's like, I, I tell you, we all just got the chills like, you're kidding me, God. You are kidding me. And so then I tell you, you know, then all day these people are passing out this food that they know this came from God. We're, we're on this mission from God. You start experiencing things like that, like a family. And I'm telling you, all the other stuff, the petty stuff we're fighting over, it really make no sense when you start looking beyond yourself, focused on the mission, seeking the kingdom first. I really believe that is the answer to our marriages. Um, so, Lisa. I asked Lisa to share some thoughts to the women, with the women. and then... I thought maybe you'd never let me share. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, I felt like the Lord had me get into Philippians for today. It just came so alive, and the whole book, everything jumped out, and um, felt like this is what the Lord wanted me to share with you. Uh, In chapter 3 of Philippians, Paul is talking about the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ. And starting in verse 12, he is referring to that righteousness. And he says, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, Sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Only let us press on toward the goal, the real goal of our lives. Ladies, we have to do this. We can't stop pressing on in every area of our lives, but maybe even especially marriages, 
because it's such a powerful way to display the gospel to the world, to your children, to your neighbors. By the way that you treat your husband, you can make Christ look very attractive or rather ugly. And I can't tell you how truly disappointing and heartbreaking it is to think that the marriages in the church are just as messed up as marriages in the world. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. I feel like there's got to be moments when God, as our Heavenly Father, is saying, shame on you. I, I put you here. I put you here. I gave you life. He saved us. He redeemed us. He put his spirit in us. And then we can't stop arguing with our husband. It doesn't make sense. How did we, as God's children, called out from the world, how do we completely lose sight of the gospel? How do we completely lose sight of the goal, the upward call that God has given to us? I was reading a foreword to a book. I never read forewords. I don't even think I've read Francis's forewords. But I know the Lord wanted me to read this because what Johnny Erickson Tata said, maybe some of you don't know, she has just been an amazing influence in the Christian church, struggled as a quadriplegic for over 40 years. She's now in her 60s. And struggling with quadriplegia was a pretty surmountable, I mean insurmountable in our minds. I mean, that, that's probably... Maybe we could vote that one of the worst trials you could possibly have. But watching her honor Christ and love Jesus and and do something with her life, it has just, every time I physically see her, I am encouraged in Christ. But at one point, she started struggling with chronic pain. And she writes in this foreword about this was a new battle for her. Suddenly she was dealing with pain and she was feeling overwhelmed. And she said something that I'll never forget. It wasn't until I realized that God's glory was at stake in how she responded to that pain, in how she continued to respond to her quadriplegia. It wasn't until she realized that God's glory is at stake was she able to find the motivation to keep pursuing God and changing and And I thought, man, do I need to bring that into every area of my life. God's glory is at stake in our marriages, in the way that you love your husband, in the way that you treat him, in the way that you submit to his leadership. That's pretty high stakes. Philippians 2, verse 14, it says, do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the word, world, holding fast to the word of life. And I guess my question today is, is there a desire in you to shine as a light in the midst of this crooked and twisted generation? Is there a desire in you to look completely radically different than the world? Are you concerned about making sure that your life reflects what is taught in this book? If there is, You know, I don't want to come here and say, oh, we we, we just need to be ashamed of ourselves and, oh, we're so terrible. Please don't misunderstand me. I want to 
hope and courage and, and a reminder and say, don't forget, you've probably just lost sight of the goal. It happens, but, but now I want to remind you of it again. Remember who you are in Christ and what you're here to do. Is there a desire in you? Remember how God wants us to shine, to look different than the word, world? I have spoken and counseled with a lot of women over the last 18 years. It used to scare me half to death because I think I've been married, you know, a couple years, and I'm supposed to, I'm listening to a woman who is going through some pretty hard stuff. That still scares me half to death because I don't have wisdom in and of myself, but that's why I can rest in this because here's truth and here's hope and here's courage. Here's everything that we need. I don't have what you need, but God does. And can I tell you that no matter how varied the circumstances are and how totally horrible the circumstances are and who is most at fault, I have only seen women respond one of two ways. They either respond in pride or humility. Those are the only two I've seen. And pride leads to destruction. The prideful person is defensive and angry and blame-shifting and selfish and is not concerned at all about the gospel or the goal. And the humble person is just broken over their own sin. And they're more concerned with honoring God than they are about arguing about their rights and what they deserve. And they are trying, by the grace of God, to stay focused on the gospel and the goal. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That is a verse I repeat in my home a whole lot. I say that to my kids all the time. God opposes the proud, but he gives, and I expect them to be able to fill in the blank. Grace to the humble, Mom. That's right. I was reading in a book about the word opposes, because maybe we just kind of, oh, God opposes the proud. Do you realize that it means that he stands actively against you when you are responding in pride? God responds actively against you when you are in pride. But on the other side, he generously flows out his grace in your life when you respond with humility. Don't you want God's grace to just fill you up, to flow out of you? If you're in a difficult overwhelming place right now, I, I'm just begging you, please respond in humility before the Lord. He will give you what you need. And you know what will end up happening is he'll transform you. And all along, you secretly thought all he needed to do was transform your husband. And you'd, it would all be great. But God's agenda is to transform you and your heart and to give you grace every, every, every time you humble yourself before him. What what Lisa just did, even in sharing... um, it's almost exemplary of what I was talking about. Like, I'm sitting here listening to her. I mean, she's even better at this service than last service. Um, but I'm going, wow, that's good. Wow, that's really good. You know, but there's this side where when she does that, I just go, man, she's so awesome. Like, I, I, just, I just go, man, I, I love her. I, I, when I see her serving God, it was the same way when, I, when I'm seeing my little girl washing feet and telling people about Jesus, the big smile on her face. It's like, God girl and you, you just you just love and you know even that, that the night after the conference when I'm driving home and little Mercy's with me and she's like Dad, I don't want to leave it was so good I go I know honey and it's just like this 
as we serve him, there's something that happens. And I'm listening to her words and going, wow, she's, she's nailing it. It's that, it's that humility. And, and there are those people that are just constantly seeing the fault of others. And they don't see it in themselves. And, and I don't want to be one of those people. And, and um, ah, so many thoughts ran through my mind as she was, as she was speaking. But uh, now I forgot them all. So let me uh, share what I was going to say just to the men real briefly. Because I, I was thinking, what do, what do I want to say to the guys? If I could just say one thing to the men. And my message would be this. Be strong. Act like a man. And I don't think you hear that anymore because we're told in our day and age you're not supposed to tell the men to act like men. Just tell them to act more like women, you know? And that's not the message of Scripture. Uh, The Scripture says to the men, act like men, be strong. Stand firm in your faith. I've been reading about some of the men in Scripture, and I go, God. That's who I want to be. I want to be like that guy. You know, I mean, some of these stories, and, and you realize, man, I have the same, the same Holy Spirit in, in me as this guy right here. And, and you see, because I've been to too many, like, men's retreats where guys start crying and saying, oh, you know why? I was addicted to pornography, and, and I was doing good, but then my accountability group stopped calling me. Where? So what could I do except go back to my computer? Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, you poor sissy, you know? It's like, man, is that the way a man of God talks? Or, oh, my accountability group, they didn't do this, or my wife didn't do that, so I had this affair. It's like, what are you, man? Uh, How, when, when, when Lisa was talking about the glory of God is at stake, like, I represent God. Is my God a God going, well, I was going to do it, and then, you know, Holy Spirit didn't help me eat it. What does he do up there? Oh, the angels didn't get it. No, I, I serve a God who is strong, who is powerful, who says, I fear nothing. Okay, I'm going to take it on. I'm going to defeat death for you. I'll defeat sin. I, I'll defeat anyone. No one. That's my God. And how do I represent him as a man? By just sitting around and being weak all the time and and making excuses and blaming other people? Man, the glory of God is at stake. God is a strong God, and I want to represent him well and be a strong man. You know, I mean, I get convicted when I read some of these guys in Scripture. I was reading 1 Samuel 30 the other day, and it's talking about David, and I read that, I go, oh. There's a man right there. There's a man. That's who I want to be. God, I'm sorry. I haven't measured up to that. Make me that guy. I am going to be that guy. I want to become that guy. I need to be that man for my family, for my wife, for my kids. That's the type of man I want my kids to marry. And so I want to display that. I mean, a lot of commentators, they say that 1 Samuel 30 is, 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 is in this situation that David wrote Psalm 40. The psalm that many of us know, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined and heard my cry. He lifted me up out of that pit and set my feet on a rock. Do you know when he wrote that? It seems like it, they say 1 Samuel 30. In 1 Samuel 30, the story is, it says when David and his men, these are the soldiers, they, they come to Ziklag on the third day. The Amalekites made a raid against uh, Nechab and against Ziklag. They overcame Ziklag, burned it with fire, and they took captive all the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. So when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire. And their wives and sons and daughters were taken captive. And then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and they wept till they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives, just ignore that part. Um, <laughs> Todd will explain that next week. Um, David, okay, when I say I want to be like David, not that far. Okay, David's, uh, he was human. David's two wives, they also had been taken captive. Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed, 
For the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Oh, wow, that's bad. Here is a guy with his army getting back to the city and going, they took all our wives and kids. They burned down everything we own. My wife, my my kids, my my little girl, they took, and all the soldiers are just, can you imagine a bunch of men coming back to find their sick? Guys, picture, your wife and your kids have been carried away, and you come back expecting to see them, and you're just like, what just happened? And so all you guys are just getting together, and you're just wailing, because you just lost everything you love, everything you cared for, everything that was dear to you is gone. And so it says, man, it was one of those wailing sessions where they go, man, they, they just didn't even have, they would have cried longer, but they didn't have any strength left. And then at that point, as David's crying, like, man, everything, I love it, what, what's going on? Then everyone starts saying, it's his fault. It's David's fault. He screwed this whole thing up. And they go, let's kill David. Let's stone him to death. So now imagine yourself being David. You just got done mourning. Man, those, those soldiers, those idiots, they took my family. What are they doing to them right now? What are they doing to my wife? What are they doing to my kids? You know, you're going through all this, and now all of your men turn on you and say, it's your fault, we're going to kill you. What would you do, men? And David goes, I waited patiently for the Lord. And he strengthened himself in the Lord. And I go, wow, that's a man right there. I want to be that. I, none of us have ever been in a situation like that. That's the power that is available to us. That's the power that's available to us. And I go, God, that's, that's what I got to be for my family That's what I got to be for your glory. I want to represent you well. And I go, God, I am so sorry because there have been times when I've broken down on stuff that's a fraction of this. And I'm ashamed of that. That does not represent you well. Your glory is at stake. God, strengthen me. Make me into this guy. Just just in closing, I I just want to say this. Um... Lisa and I have been married for almost 18 years now, and uh, it's just been awesome. It's just been an amazing journey. The kids, I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable, and it's all to his glory. The only thing that I may have done well was trying to follow the Spirit of God to follow the Spirit of God. Because the truth is, is never in history, all of human history, have a Spirit-filled couple gotten a divorce. It's never happened. No no, no two Spirit-led individuals divorce. It's never happened. It can't happen. Because if you're Spirit-led, there's only one Spirit. He's going to lead you in the same direction. And so the whole idea is what the Bible says is that's why he says if you walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5, 16, you won't carry out the desires of the flesh. If you're following the Spirit, you can't fight. The only time we can fight is when we stop walking in the Spirit. And and whenever we fight, it's always because one of us is not walking in the Spirit. And (laughs) it's just this... (laughs) But it is this idea that... uh, I'm kidding... Um, man, that's the whole thing. That's what I'm trying to get at. And this whole point is, it goes back full circle again, is Holy Spirit, if we follow, if if we seek your kingdom first and we just go, okay, Holy Spirit, where do you want us to go? All these other things will be added unto you. The unity, the love, the peace that God wants. And and when you start serving him together, it's amazing what will happen. Um, and I know some of you, maybe, maybe all of us are a little scared to follow the Holy Spirit. And let's just be honest with that. 
We will say things in church. Oh, I follow the Spirit. Really? You really want to know what the Holy Spirit wants you to do after service right now? Would you surrender to that? What if he wants you to move? Well, well, you know, there's got to be parameters, boundaries. I read a book. No. Just go, Holy Spirit, where do you want me to go? Where do you want me to live? What do you want me to drive? What do you want me to wear? What do you want us to eat today? Holy Spirit, lead us. What, based on everything I know in this book, where would you want me to eat? Where would you want me to, who would you want me to talk to? Are, are you leading us anywhere? And as you both start pursuing that, there'll be an amazing union. But that's a scary thing because we like control. We like parameters. Okay, I'll follow the Holy Spirit as long as. And it's like, no, that's not the way this works. Jesus says, you follow me. He told his disciples, follow me. They did, well, where are we going first? Put your net down and follow me. Well, can I at least say goodbye? No, then just forget it. Can I bury my debt? No. I said, follow me. And that's what the Holy Spirit says today. You follow me. And I tell you, if you did that as a couple, you're you're not going to fight. It's it's when you back off from the Holy Spirit and his mission and his leading. Do I still get scared? Even after all these miracles that God's shown me in my life, I mean, it's like, God, have you ever shown anyone this much? This is crazy. And yet I still get scared to take the next step of faith and go, okay, I surrender to you again. Where where do you want me? Where do you want me to go? I mean, I don't know. Holy Spirit could bring me back to Simi Valley. Holy Spirit could send me to India. Holy Spirit could send me wherever. And then as a family, we're going to do that. And if so... Then it's going to be a, it's going to be an awesome life. But if you try to save your life and protect it from the Holy Spirit, you're going to lose it. You can just try to save your family and go. No, we're just going to stay here, be tight, be close. You know what? You're going to lose your family. But you say, you know what, God? I release my family to you, man. When Rachel went back to Thailand by herself, you know, in the summer, I mean, we're like. It really seems like that's where God's leading her, but we're going to let our 15-year-old fly to Thailand by herself? Man, you, you think there, there wasn't some fear in there, but it's like, no, wait, who do I believe in? No, this is a God, and you are leading her there. It really seems like everything points there. And Oh, man, I, I tell you, there's still fear. I'm telling you, it's the greatest way to live. And you seek his kingdom first, and it was an amazing experience. Here's how we're going to close it up. I'm going to ask the uh, elders and the, to come line the front of the stage here. I'm going to have the worship team come up. And um, I, I asked if the elders could come and just be available to pray for some of you. Because I think some of you as couples, you just need some prayer right now. One, maybe because you're struggling, or two, maybe because... You're just too into each other and your family and you, you've just kind of left the mission behind and you haven't made a disciple your whole married life. And you want that to change. And uh, I'm going to ask you to humble yourself and come before one of the elders and say, can you pray for us? Because uh, I, I just believe there's bigger things for our marriage than what we've done so far. And I'm kind of ashamed and the glory of God has been at stake and we haven't made God look real beautiful by the way we've been married and we have been too self-centered or whatever it is, and just have them lay hands on you and pray over you. Or maybe you're, 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 a, you're here by yourself because your husband or wife has, wants nothing to do with Jesus or his mission right now, and you just need prayer. Then I'm going to invite you to come, and they'll pray over you. And, and, and may that be a message to some of you who are single right now or dating or whatever, courting, uh, you look at what we're, we're, we're talking about here, and some of you that, that are in these marriages where you're not, it's not two believers together. And some of you, it's because you became a believer after you got married, and I understand that. But for those of you who are single, you'll, you'll never have this unless you marry someone that loves Jesus like you do and genuinely has a spirit in them, not just calls himself a Christian. Man, I, this room is filled with people that have regrets and would tell you, man, I, I made a mistake. Um, in that sense. I didn't follow God at that time, and it's been really difficult. And I'm saying, man, it can be so beautiful 
when you both are on this mission together, and that's what you want for your life. That's what I want everyone to experience. And maybe you just need those prayers, and so these elders are here, and maybe you just need to understand Jesus all together, and so there'll be people in the prayer room to pray over you. If you want to get baptized today, that would be amazing that you could start your journey with God today. But um, right now, as we worship God, uh, just humble yourselves as couples or individuals and just come to an elder and, and ask for prayer if you don't believe that your, 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 your family is on mission right now and yet you want them to be.